And uh, so now I'm happy to introduce to you Mina, Mr. D Dr. Mina Davidan, that you just met. But uh, for those who read the program properly, um, we have a change in program. So Anna Höglund was unfortunately ill. She has a cold. She's fine. But uh, we are super happy that Mina uh, spent most of last night um, preparing <laughs> to, to give her uh, some more reflections from her work and under the title Operationalizing Leaving No One Behind. So, welcome. Thank you. Um, a very good morning. <clears throat> and as um, Louise was saying, I'm the backup speaker, so cut me some slack. And I'm also going to use this opportunity to put across some reflections that I've had along my journey so that you can actually do the same and maybe add to that list. So, um, so I, I was thinking about what to actually talk about that would, that would put the theme of the summit into perspective as well as the theme of this particular session. And I thought, okay, this, we are actually in the, I mean, towards the end of the SDG era. We're coming to the close of the Agenda 2030. And we have been talking about leaving no one behind. But when we actually talk about it, what do we, what do we really mean? And what are some of, the, some of my reflections on maybe the challenges and some of the considerations to think about in actually operationalizing this uh, from the perspective of food environment transformations? So, uh, and I have to say, I actually will come back, Corinna, to your presentation and maybe put a little more burden on the poor food system because I will again go back to one specific part of the food system, but I also hope that, that we will also talk about some things which actually contribute to the heart health of the food systems, right? So, so I will actually start by situating my work so you can actually understand where I come from. So I work mainly with intervention and implementation research for uh, non-communicable diseases, especially prevention. So, so my, that is really my entry point into, fo into food environment um, and food environment studies or food environment research. So it's really this part of the food systems. It's a very key node in the food systems. And I recognize that we are further maybe fragmenting or focusing on one part of the food systems, but it is a key node where actually it is the interface that mediates people's acquisition and consumption within the wider food system. So it is a really key node in terms of interaction. So this interaction between the personal food environments and the external food environments, that's really the, the space that, that I focus on in my work. And also in terms of um, during this presentation, I will refer to some of my work, um, so mostly implementation research projects, which are represented by that small red square that you see along the um, efficacy to implementation pipeline. And this square represents the bulk of my research focus in terms of, and a lot of the examples that I actually present will uh, be based on my work both in Sweden and in India, as well as a few other countries. And also, during this presentation, I'll reflect a little bit about the other work that we have done, which is maybe the furthest I have come uh, in terms of uh, the work with intervention and implementation, which is to really look at, um, which is to actually look uh, on the shift, um, the shift framework, which you actually uh, heard in the workshop highlights. So we actually, this was a tool that was, um, that was developed to actively enable an equity focus throughout the food environment transformation process. And it actually uh, consists of three parts. So it has a four-step process, it has a compendium of good practices, and it has resources. And as I've said in the highlights, this is a work in progress. And based on the feedback from the workshop, there will be some reflections here, but also a lot of work that needs to be actually done in order to align it with, um, with, uh, with a lot of the things that you have heard both today and yesterday. So, so I think one of the first things that I alluded to in the, that in the morning is about operationalizing the concept. So uh, for me, 
leaving no one behind is in a way thinking about equity but it is also maybe only one part of equity because there there are a lot of other considerations for equity as well when you think about the concept uh, when you think about operationalizing the concept so from our discussions yesterday and also from some of the other discussions we've had in relation to the research projects that we run is it that we are actually looking at addressing differential needs capabilities opportunities and resources are we looking at reducing gaps maybe between groups or do we have a universal goal that we are actually you know trying to reduce gaps of all the different population groups against a universal goal so what is and how is it that we are actually operationalizing this particular concept and um, in in my work i have mainly done that by looking at geographically defined communities so even when we have worked with individuals and households we have worked with geographically defined communities uh, so maybe under resourced uh, areas in uganda could be rural areas where the the bulk of the resources go actually to urban health systems and not to rural health systems it could be urban townships in south africa and it could be socio economically disadvantaged areas in stockholm and uppsala which is some of the areas that we work in and also in one of the current um, projects that we are working in we are also looking at actually mapping um, areas of disadvantage in terms of areas that have the highest prevalence of uh, of cardio metabolic conditions for example against so the lowest socio economic uh, status so this map that you actually see here is from crush covid it's one of the research projects that is focused on covid and it's just an example to show how postal codes have been mapped this one actually shows vaccination uptake but we're trying to do something similar in terms of cardio metabolic risk factors and looking at which are the postal codes that actually have the highest um, uh, that have the highest prevalence and it's connected to the lowest um, to the to the most disadvantage and uh, working in the swedish context one of the things that those of you who work in this context will also realize is that uh, socio economic disadvantage especially in urban areas is so tightly coupled with for example proportion of immigrants that it's almost difficult to separate the two it is so tightly connected together we usually end up using one variable or the other you can't actually use both and um, and also the depending on depending on how the areas that we actually work with depending on how you actually define immigrants we are working with areas where you have maybe 30% and over uh, of immigrant populations and we are also looking at um, how i mean when you look at the neighborhood areas one of the things is you don't look specifically at uh, at specific populations within that subgroup so native populations who live in these areas we i mean they are as disadvantaged in terms of uh, of living in vulnerable areas and there is the concept of uh, deprivation amplification which is to look at how individual socio economic status actually is amplified also by neighborhood deprivation and that is something that you actually see in areas and that is one of the contributors to the poor health outcomes that we that we also see so that has been one of the reasons why we tend to focus mainly on geographically defined areas and another thing that we have also realized in uh, in some of the work that we have done in stockholm is that identifying areas or identifying population groups is one thing but reaching them is is another thing altogether so this is an example from one of the studies that we did in uh, in stockholm where we looked at the reach of community versus facility based screening for uh, for type 2 diabetes and what we realized is that we are uh, reaching different populations so in the facilities you reach older and also more native born european population while in the communities you actually reach more of the younger and the non european population and and the population that we access through the communities or we reach through the communities are also the ones who will who will come to the health facilities only when they are really sick so by the time they come to the health facility we have lost that window of opportunity for prevention so we need to actually 
think about strategies which are different from mainstream in order to access different segments of the population. And if we, if we want to actually think about prevention in terms of you know, leaving no one behind. And um, so if you think about neighborhoods as a unit of intervention, as we have done in several uh, projects, what we, if you and you look at literature, the, the association between health outcomes and neighborhood uh, socioeconomic status is often pretty mixed. So the, in Netherlands, for example, this particular study that uh, they have shown, they actually found that participants living in low socioeconomic status areas had a higher BMI than their peers, and this is related to the fast food outlets within one kilometer. And healthy food outlets did not buffer the potentially unhealthy impact of the fast food outlets. So this is one of the, this is a very recent study. And, but in general, there has been a lot of mixed results, and it is mainly also to do with how food environments have been defined in many of these studies, you know, in terms of how the, how the food environments have been measured and mapped in, in, these, in these studies. So that could also be one of the reasons why we often tend to see mixed, um, mixed studies, mixed results, sorry. So in one of our studies that we have looked at, um, in, again, in Stockholm, uh, which is done by one of my PhD students, what we have found is that food uh, and vegetable prices in low uh, socio or in socioeconomically disadvantaged areas is actually lower than the food than the prices in the in the more affluent areas and you also see the reverse when you look at the type of stores for example independent uh, grocers and different type of ethnic stores you actually see that they are more in the socioeconomically disadvantaged areas and that is probably what mediates the lower prices but what we are unclear of is whether this lowered prices actually reflects or leads to or translates to better affordability. We don't know that yet. Hopefully that's the next thing that we, that we will actually look at. And um, when you, and working with, uh, so when we work in communities, therefore food retailers become actually one of the key stakeholders. And uh, qualitative studies that we have done with food retailers, for example, they talk about three things that would actually, that motivates them or that, that drives them. So it's trends, it's demand, and it is laws or regulations. So for them, I mean, recommendations don't really help them because it puts a lot of uh, pressure on them to do one thing or the other. And at the same time, trends and demands are not really driven by the most vulnerable groups. So we are kind of, again, in a dilemma there. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, when you talk to the higher level in, um, in food retailers, they talk about corporate social responsibility and how it is actually important to look at health interventions. But that rarely trickles down to the local level, especially in the disadvantaged areas. You see a difference in the narrative when you go from the top to the, uh, to the bottom. And uh, so we come back to this. So if you're, we're thinking about interventions, and we come back to this, the, the combination of population approach and high-risk approach. And there, is, there are literature which talks about what is actually missing in this, which is that maybe we need to think about addressing vulnerable and disadvantaged groups through a third but integrated approach within these two approaches that we are looking at because that is that's missing and we know that when we look at, at the data in terms of who actually benefits from a lot of the of the interventions and the policies that we that are um, prevalent now I'm running out of time, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about engaging communities. And I think one of the things that we have struggled with, I've worked with a lot of participate, different types of participatory approaches across different projects. And I think uh, one of the things that we look at, it's important to engage communities, but how do we engage communities and how do we engage different types of stakeholders? So you can go from different types of approaches all the way from consultation to co-creation. and uh, which method can you use where and with whom? And also, when do you need the overview? And, and to be very conscious of the fact that co-design fatigue is very, very real. And we co-design is a buzzword now, so we talk about co-design all the time. But to think about what it actually means in terms of both the voice and the agency of the people who are being represented in the co-design groups. 
And then last, I would like to point to this, some of the unintended outcomes. For example, this study that we did in India, uh, looking at changing household dietary behaviors, what we actually saw after one year of intervention using stage match strategies, community-based, was that food, uh, fruit and vegetable procurement actually increased, uh, but vegetable intake stayed the same, and, um, or rather there was no change between intervention and control group. And one thing we actually saw was that gender was an independent variable for, independent predictor for um, for vegetable intake and socioeconomic status was a mediator. So low middle income households, we could see that males had better uh, f uh, vegetable intake than actually females. And you can, we can relate it back to the formative studies we have done where we could see that women actually prioritize the needs of their spouses and their children. So that you can actually see reflected in the data. And I think one of the, one of the, success things was also looking at locally available uh, fru veg fruits and vegetables. So what we actually saw was irrespective of the trend, like there was high inflation at that time and very, uh, very steep rise in fruit and vegetable prices in the market. But in spite of that, the intervention groups were actually able to increase procurement. And that was solely related to actually the procurement of locally available fruits and vegetables, especially vegetables and mainly vegetables which were like forgotten, maybe you know, across generations you kind of forget uh, what, what we have used, forget because you know, some things take more time, some things take more effort, and you use certain knowledge across generations. So we, we actually focused on that as one of the strategies in the, in the intervention, and households which were able to, act, to use those strategies, they were able to show an increase in fruit and vegetable uh, procurement. So I will actually just conclude by giving you the a few points of my reflections and hope that you will actually add to this list when you're thinking about uh, considerations for leaving no one behind. So maybe a common understanding of the concept and also thinking about both the identity, I, identif both the identifying and reaching populations, looking at neighborhoods as a potential unit of intervention so place-based interventions that we see now, and addressing vulnerable groups uh, separately uh, and strategically, and also context always throwing up very unexpected challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mina, for an excellent presentation.